CBS then put out a study from Americans basically feeling like they priced out of the housing market. Take a look. There's a new study out of Harvard that has found millions of Americans are simply being priced out of home ownership. Yeah, I'm sure many of, you, many of you feel this already. The school's joint Center for Housing study says both homeowners and renters are struggling with high housing costs. Take a look at this. The U.S. home price index is 47% higher than in early 2020. That's pushing the median uh, sales price to about five times an average household income, which is just incredible. Meantime, rents are up 26% across the country since early 2020. Joining us now is Chris Herbert. He is the managing director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. So, Chris, we know about inflation. We know that there's a lot of drivers. But in, in, when it comes to housing in particular, what is fueling this trend? Why are rental and housing costs really outpacing everything else, particularly including salaries? It's important to look at both the short term and the long term in thinking about what's happening in the housing market. In the short term, what we had was almost a perfect storm during the pandemic. Going into the pandemic, we had tight housing markets to begin with. We had low vacancy rates for both for sale and rental housing. And then during the pandemic, we had an incredible increase in demand for housing, both as people came to realize they weren't just going to live in their homes, but work and study there because they had more money because they weren't spending money on anything else pretty much. And because student loans were deferred, you put together that plus interest rates below 3% and that tight supply led to this increase. In <laughs> this is insane, bro. Rent prices is up 26%. I told y'all three years ago, I said, listen, man, it's about to get bad. It's going to get, it's going to be gnashing of teeth. It's going to get horrific in these streets. It's going to get so bad. You're going to wish that you could rewind time and take the advice that I gave y'all as far as making sure that y'all made adjustments in order to benefit off of this. I warned you. I said, listen, inflation, y'all taking all of this free money, y'all voting this person in office. It's going to get horrific and inflation is not even going to come down. Them raising rates is not going to lower the price of inflation because it's going to be artificial. Nobody is going to want to sell because they know that they don't have anywhere to go in order to take the money that they made from the place that they sold. Unless you move them from California because everybody was trying to get out of California before the uh, mansion tax hit. And then Californians ran down to Texas. They ran to Austin. They ran to Florida. They ran to all of these other places. They ran to the Carolinas. They went to Memphis, not Memphis, Nashville. And then they artificially inflated those economies because they took all of the money that they can steal out of their homes in order to get away from California to ultimately run to these other places. So even when you raise rates, they were just going to price out everybody else. And meanwhile, LA was building skid row luxury apartments with short tax dollars. And nobody is going to sell their home because don't nobody want to go and finance a home for 7%. Why would you give up, take the equity out of your house when you still have to pay a house note, you're not 1031 exchanging it, and then you go and finance another house for literally more than triple what the interest rates was that you did when you originally financed your house over in 2020. And when you financed your house in 2021 and 2020, you did it at an at an in <laughs> you did it at an inflated price. So you didn't even really get the savings. You get you just got a better interest rate because y'all was paying a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars over asking just to get the house in the first place with no inspection. So now you house poor with a low interest rate, with a bad, with a bad house note and higher property taxes that you can't even afford, but you still can't afford to move because you can't buy another place at a higher interest rate, which is then going to be worse for you. Look at the death loop that we created for ourselves with bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Think about this for a minute. Even with the, the lower interest rate, you got higher property taxes, maintenance costs, inflated price that you paid for your home that you wasn't supposed to even be in in the first place. And then you can't sell because you can't move because you still won't be able to afford the new interest rate. And you still got student loans that kick back in because some of y'all didn't even get y'all student loans forgiven from taxpayers. This is literally, a, I, I called it word for word. I said that this was going to happen.
And I told y'all on top of that, that the, that a hundred thousand dollars was going to be the new 50. A hundred thousand dollars was going to be the new 50. Y'all complained, y'all bitched, y'all moaned. Oh, anti, you don't know what I said. Listen, I'm telling you, everybody knows that this is happening. They got money. Everybody that's paying attention, that's, that's playing a real estate game that really understand what the game is. They know what's about to happen. This is playing out. I said, listen, y'all, I'm not buying nothing right now. I'm not buying nothing but land. This is what I, this is what my play is. Oh, no, no, no. You could just get it. With it. Welcome. Welcome to suffering. And housing prices that you're showing on the screen now. So the short run story is that tight supply against strong demand. But I think it's important to look at a longer term perspective. If we go back decades, we'll find that housing costs have been outpacing incomes since the 1960s. Why is that? Partly because of the fact that land on which all homes sit has been growing faster than incomes. And secondly, because the homes that we're putting there have gotten larger, higher quality, and the, the efficiencies in the construction of homes that we've seen in other industries like automaking and the like, there haven't been those uh, increases in the efficiency of construction to bring down those costs. Look at the, look at the <laughs> first quarter of 2021. Now you gotta remember, that it was still an inflated price because everybody was trying to move out for the pandemic. And so they was paying more for their homes, right? $82,000 for the same place that you paying for three years later at 120. At 120, you're paying almost a 34% increase, 32, 33, 34% increase in the cost of being able to purchase a home right now because everything is artificially inflated. High land costs, high cost of construction have outpaced incomes for a long time, but they got a lot worse during the pandemic. Now, I'm looking into your report and you do highlight that single family construction is accelerating across the country. So there is a gradual increase in um, the availability of homes. But what kind of future is this cost making for all of us, particularly, you know, groups hardest hit by high housing and rental expenses? Yeah. Y'all going to do van life. You gonna do van life? Uh, you know, we we are seeing single family construction uh, rise modestly, which is kind of shocking when you consider that it, interest rates have been north of seven yeah. percent. But the reason for that is because the fact that most homeowners are sitting on mortgages under four percent, in many cases under three percent, they're just not inclined to sell and have to face those higher mortgage costs. So with so few existing homes on the market, home builders are responding by doing what they can. But in terms of what this means, I mean, it is, it's really pricing out first time home buyers. You know, the cost of a, a monthly payment on a median price home at north of $3,000, you need $120,000 in income to afford that, it means only one in seven renters can afford homes. So for young folks today seeking that dream of home ownership, the path to get there is really difficult. And I don't want to lose sight too on the rental side, the pain is being felt across the board or across renters, but mostly for very low income renters who are 83% of whom are spending more than 30% of their income, 65% are spending more than 50% of their income, and the amount they have left over at the end of the month is very little for everything else. And you gotta remember when they say spending this percentage of their income, they're talking about pre-tax. So that's not even what you take in home. They are talking about pre-tax. So after you pay your taxes, then you pay your rent, and let me tell you who else is getting absolutely destroyed in this whole market. All of the all so-called real estate gurus. Where they at though? Hey, remember when all of the real estate gurus was out here popping a collar like they was uh like the trucking industry people? And they was out here saying that, oh man, you could just become a flipper. Or you could go and just cash flow your property. Hey, how many doors you got? No, no, no. How many properties do you own? Not how many doors do you have? How many properties do you own? I've seen people call me in the rest. Anti, man, I got this. I can't afford it, whatever. Oh, I ain't, Airbnb ain't working no more and all of this stuff. What happened to all of the quick flips and the Airbnb investors? You know what I see nowadays? Trucking industry. All of these trucking gurus that bought their stuff. Wiped out. Nobody talking about getting into trucking no more all of a sudden. The boom bust industry because they didn't really understand it, right? I see all of these people that were supposedly had all of these doors. They couldn't wait to try to sell their properties. You know why? Because they wasn't cash flowing. Because they don't understand the real estate game like we break it down inside of the Patreon. The three ways that you can make truly make money and build wealth in real estate. Right? The right way to do it. Right? The reverse snowball method that we talk about inside of the bag chases in the Patreon. Right? Oh, man. I'm just that cost. 
I'm just renting it, hoping that the property value goes up because everything that they paying is just going right back into paying off the mortgage. And then they told y'all to keep pulling money out. Hey man, go and get a door, get it this, get it appraised at this, and then wind up pulling the money out and then re repeat the process. Okay, so now you got three vacancies or you went over there and you rented it out and they had a rent moratorium and now you out here stuck. You stuck. Don't know what you doing. You got one person that tore up the crib. You don't have no money to even be able to fix it up and then put somebody in it. You couldn't get him evicted within three months. And so now you had to carry the cost. That person over there, he had a squatter. You don't know what you're doing. You winging it. You winging it. You taking advice from people that don't know nothing about it. They ain't never been in the industry. They don't understand it. And they winging it. People is winging it and they don't have no clue. And you getting, you losing your shirt. You losing everything that you ever thought that you knew because you have no clue how to be out here and get your hands in the right thing to actually build real wealth. And they sold y'all and all they had to throw in the term was generational wealth in order to get you to buy into it. Oh no, I'm gonna just buy one and I'm gonna get a property management company to go over there and do it. Okay, all right. Holler at me two years from now and tell me how that worked out for you. Eventually, everything comes out to the wash and that's why I say you're gonna know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. Everything comes out to the wash. Meaning that if you just wait over a period of time, you're going to see the people that did and the people that didn't. The people that are successful, that's still showing the receipts, right? Still can show you the receipts versus the people that sit there and say, I'm not showing no receipts. I just want to continue to give you the information that you need in order to build generational wealth. No, show the receipts. It ain't bragging. We're just qualifying the people that's really able to talk about this and tell you exactly what's happening. That's what we show, we do inside of the bag chasers. We show our deposits. We show what we make. We show our W-2s. We show the properties that we own. We break down exactly what we make it from a rental perspective. We actually put our real money up, our money. We sell finance. We invest in people's businesses. We don't do all of this. All of this, this is small time. But I'm going to sell you a course. Get the, get the heck out of my face. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, neither here nor there. I went on a, on a little rant. But I do want to give y'all one solution before I read the Super Chats. You can buy this San Francisco home for half a million dollars, but you can't even move into it until 2053. Look it. It's a one-of-a-kind listing in Russian Hill that drew a long line of prospective buyers last week. My husband came in and said, you've got to look out the window. And there was a line from the house all the way to the middle of the, the, the block right here. This 1,100 square foot home at 30 Northview Court in San Francisco has three bedrooms and two baths. And it's for sale for about half a million dollars. That price tag is definitely raising eyebrows among neighbors like Isla Smith. Selling for $488,000. I, I, don't, I don't know what to make of it. It all came as a big surprise to all of us here on the street. The listing posted on Zillow says the home is tenant occupied and to be sold at. Somebody said, Anton, you're building a home. No, we build in multiple different homes, but you said you're building a home. How has it affected your home? I don't understand it. You got to rephrase the question. What exactly does that mean? As is, the buyer won't be able to move in until 2053. That's another 30 years. The new owner would have to buy the house subject to a very long rental lease uh, that is uh, currently being offered to, to an individual. According to the listing, the current tenant will continue to live there and pay the same amount of rent every month. The current tenant pays $417 a month. So the deal is you can buy the house for a half a million. You can give me a half a million up front. You will own the property, but the lease for the current tenant is that they'll be able to live there for the next 30 years at $400 a month, 30 years at $400 a month. And you can't even take control of the property until 2053. Or rent. We went to the offices of Park North Real Estate hoping to talk to the two real estate agents listing the property. No one was available to comment. We then talked to an attorney specializing in landlord tenant law. For some reason, they gave this person a 30 year right of possession. 
I've seen that before. It's kind of a sloppy way of estate planning. Like I want to leave some security to this person so they don't have to worry about where they're going to live. And they do it that way. I think they should have done it a different way. Attorney Stephen McDonald says the home will be sold as is with the stated conditions. Take it or leave it. It's for a very, very unique buyer that's willing to get a big, big discount. Maybe, you know, two thirds, maybe pay one million for a three million dollar house and wait 10 or 20 years before you can move in. A bargain for someone if they're willing to wait. In San Francisco, Suzanne Fawn, ABC7 News. Buy that joint and burn that bitch down. I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> did I say that out loud? I didn't say that out loud. I didn't mean to say that. I'm going to scratch that part out. Anyways, let's continue to move on. We got a couple different things that we want to tackle.